wonderful Sunday, let's turn to that most marvelous book in the Bible, the Gospel of Mark. I invite you to turn to Mark chapter 14. Our text today is Mark chapter 14, verses 29 through 31. Now you might remember our Lord is, has just shared the Passover. He's with his disciples in these last hours before his arrest. And he has told his disciples a series of bad news, other than the fact that he's going to be resurrected. But one of the things he has told them is that they would fall away. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, I should add, by the way, that whenever the Lord comes in with a truly, <laughs> look out, that's truth. Truly, I say to you that you yourself this very night before a cock crows twice shall three times deny me. But he kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they were all saying the same thing too. Well, Father God, this is your word. And I pray now, Lord, that our hearts would be open wide to the guidance and leading and teaching and anointing of the Holy Spirit. That we would receive a word from the Lord. And I pray now, Father, you'll take these notes in front of me and allow them to be a message from you, Lord, to encourage to challenge, chastise perhaps, I don't know, but Lord, whatever it is, we'll look to you with expectancy. In Jesus' name, amen. As most of you know by now, I enjoy taking on house projects. In fact, just for the fun of it, I decided to leave a little bit of white paint on this arm here this morning just to remind myself. My father, who, while he taught us how to change the oil in a car, or to change a tire, except for roofing my father's and mother's home and also my grandparents' house. Those skills that I have acquired over the years, carpentry, plumbing, simple electrical work, are, are things I've learned from other people. It all began for me when I went to Christian school in eighth, ninth, and 10th grade. Our principal, Mr. Watson, told all of us that he was going to teach us how to sheetrock. And so that's what we did. And I began, had my first early experiences with spackle. And, and over the years, I have honed that skill. And it's something I, I do rather well at this point. When we first got our first house in Burlington, New Jersey, as things would always happen, the very first day we're going into our house, there was a plumbing problem. As it turned out, my realtor also did a little bit of plumbing as a sideline. And so he took me downstairs and he introduced me to the art of how to use a blowtorch and the absolutely necessary detail of, of, of learning that you must have a very, very clean surface uh, before you go any further. And he also, for those of you who are plumbers, that day taught me the old bread trick if you don't know what that is, if you have a little bit of water in the line and you just can't get it out no matter what you do, get yourself some nice Wonder Loaf white bread, take the white part and shove it inside the pipe. And so that keeps the water from coming down the pipe while you're, while you're torching it. Anyway, I'll just leave that there with you. I'm learning, you're probably learning some things saying, I'm glad I came to church today. Now I know how to do that. As for electrical work, I have to be careful because my one of our children is, of course, trained in that area, but I do change outlets. I have changed light switches. I have also called electricians to help me on things I don't understand. Uh, I definitely have learned it's always better to first shut off the electricity. 
but uh, whether uh, we uh, do these things for a living, whether or not we'll admit to it, those of you who do these things for a living, on uh, these skills that I have acquired over many years, and I'm still developing, those skills have also come with many failures. I remember, for example, in our house in Burlington, I decided to do a little electrical work upstairs in the attic. And I was feeling lazy because that was a three-story house all the way down to the basement. And so I decided, no need to shut off the electricity. Let's just go ahead and do it. Well, and so there I was huddled in the attic with a flashlight until the wire torched in front of me and then all of a sudden I had a flame. And uh, my heart, you can imagine, just about leaped out of my chest because I was, all, I was in the process of getting ready to burn the house down. Not a good thing. I learned my lesson. Well, you would think, when we were living in Ireland, the land of 240 volt, I decided to fix a light switch in our hallway. Again, being lazy, I didn't turn it off. And let me just tell you something. If you've ever been hit by 240, it really hurts. I thought my arm was going to come off when I did that. And of course, as for plumbing, the road to success, of course, also means that there are moments of failure. Uh, you know, when you say to someone else in the other room, okay, go ahead, turn, the, turn it back on, and then it sprays you in the face. Um, but I've learned a lot in that area. Uh, this last couple of years, a little few tips from our own Bob here. I've learned how to do crown molding. And I've done our three bedrooms and our living room, and I'm still rolling right along with it. Uh, I'm so glad for YouTube. Have you discovered it yet? If you don't know how to do something, just go to YouTube, type it in, and you'll see all sorts of people telling you how to do things. But as we learn, there are failures. There are failures along the way. And the question I would ask is, how have you turned your failures into personally maturing opportunities? I've entitled today's message, Living Beyond Failures, because all of us at some point, at some time or another, are going to experience failure. Now, failure uh, can also do things to us. It can cripple us. It can paralyze us. It can, if we don't, aren't careful, it can stop us from moving forward with our lives. Is that you? Well, with that in mind, enter the Apostle Peter. What we see first in verse 29 is, of course, Peter denying the possibility of failure. Look at your Bibles again. But Peter said to him, though all may fall away, yet I will not. Now, clearly at this point, Peter thought that it was impossible. I'll never deny you, Lord. He thought it was impossible to deny his master. In other words, Peter disregarded Jesus' warning that he, like the others, was about to fall away. And may I emphasize, I have no doubt, no question or hesitation believing that Peter meant what he said, that when push came to shove, he fully intended to stand shoulder to shoulder with his beloved Messiah. That's because Jesus had had a huge impact on his life. If you would, please turn over to Luke chapter 5. I want to read one account. It's a powerful account. It's right in the very beginning of those early days of, of Peter and Jesus. In Luke chapter 5. And I do believe this is one of the reasons why he was saying to Jesus, I could never deny you, Lord. I couldn't do that. But in Luke 5, verse 1, Now it came about that while the multitude were pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. And he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. Of course, that's Peter and asked him to put a, a little way out from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the multitudes from the boat. 
And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let, your nets, and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered and said, Master, we, we've worked hard all night and we've caught nothing, but at your bidding, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. And they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and to help them. And they came and they filled both of the boats so that they were about to sink. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet. I, I, I believe, by the way, it's one of these verses in the Bible that if you underline in your Bibles, you're, you should underline the rest of what I'm about to read. Depart from me. For I'm a sinful man, O oh Lord. Beloved, what happened in Peter's heart? Uh, this whole issue of catching fish. He was confronted by two life transformative issues. Peter realized that he lacked faith. He didn't even have a measure of a, of a mustard seed at that point. And instead, there in verse 5 it says, that when Jesus told him to do what he really he groaned didn't he he groaned Lord we've been at this all night long don't you get it and yet he half-heartedly agreed oh we'll we'll do it put the nets in sure of course as you saw there and we all know this story it's not new to you but in verse 6 they pulled in a great quantity of fish, it says, so much so it stretched their nets to the point of breaking. Now, in the process of all this, you would think, well, everybody else, maybe they were jumping up and down. Look at the catch. Look at what we got. Oh, this is fit. There's Peter. Peter's confronted by his own spiritual deficiency in his soul because he not only lacked faith in his Lord, but verse 8, he confessed, Lord, I'm sinful. I'm sinful. You know what Peter had? He had what I'll call an Isaiah moment. Remember when Isaiah was called up into the presence of the Lord, into his holy temple? The radiance of God's glory filled that temple. And he heard the angels crying out, Holy, holy, holy. And poor Isaiah, he wept. Do you remember? I'm a man of unclean lips. You see, I'm telling you that Peter had an Isaiah moment. Suddenly, if, as if out of nowhere, the reality of Christ's glory, Christ's righteousness, Christ's holiness, it swept over him. And the secrets of his heart were laid bare. His faith at that point was a sham, and his heart, he knew it, was darkened by sin. And so what happens in Peter's life is the glorious thing is, that's not where God leaves us. Grace transformed Peter's life. And when he heard the Savior say, take up your cross and follow me, Peter, for those years that would follow, that would lead us up today to our passage in Mark 14, he would follow the Lord wherever he went. Why, that's what he did. Follow Jesus. And so in verse 29, and it's a rather emphatic statement in, in the Greek grammar, if I could just tell you that, it's so emphatic here because we see this first word, but... But, but, not me. It, it, it's it not, not, hold on there, Lord. Not me. No way. Uh, for those of us who are old enough to remember Arnold, remember Arnold? He'd say to his brother, what you talking about, Willis? Right? Remember that? Back in the day, we used to say, no way, Jose. Or Louie Baba Louie. Hold on there just a second. No way, Lord. I'm not going to do that. No way. Okay, the others might. But Peter here, glory be to God, <laughs> he's honest, but he denied the possibility of personal failure. 
Everybody else is going to fail, okay, Lord, but not me. But secondly, we also note in verse 30 that how the Lord responds, he counters Peter's assertion, doesn't he? And instead, he predicts, he says, indeed, you will fail. The scripture text, verse 30, look at it again. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, you that you yourself this very night before a cock crows twice shall three times deny me. Now, the Lord here is obviously predicting a moment in time. He's telling them, tonight, on the 14th of Nisan, while we are celebrating the Passover, before the cock even crows twice. That's not hard to understand. He says, Peter, you are going to do it. And three times so. How about that? But thirdly, in verse 31, look how Peter responds. Even though Jesus says that directly to him, Peter, he still denies the possibility. What is it with Peter? He's living in denial, isn't he? Can't happen. Verse 31 says, but Peter, he kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I'll never, I, I'm not going to deny you. Uh, do you notice the verse? And they were all saying the same thing too. Lord, I'll go to the grave if I have to. And may I add, there's a part of the story that sometimes gets left out. Do you remember when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane? And the soldiers and the priests came, to, and they were coming to arrest him, Judas leading the way. Something happened. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't name the individual, but the apostle John does. John spills the beans. You can look it up sometime. John chapter 18, verse 10. When they came to arrest Jesus, Simon Peter, therefore, having a sword, drew it, and he struck the high priest's slave and cut off his right ear. I got to imagine that when that happened, Peter's thinking to himself, See, Lord, I told you. I'm going with you all the way. Did you also notice there at the end of verse 31, this is something that this stuck out to me. And they were all saying the same thing too. And of course, it's like a sermon today because Peter is the emphasis of the text, and so we have focused there. But in truth, all the disciples were living in denial. Now, I think that one of the reasons why Peter is the focus is really because someday he was going to become a great leader in God's church. And I was thinking about all of this because I, I do think in terms of application, what, what application? In fact, there's probably more than one that we can draw from this text, and you may have your own. But let me just suggest some to you. For example, placing ourselves or yourself in a position where you deny the possibility of spiritual failure is like placing yourself on a very high perch. And you know what happens to people when they do that. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. And Humpty Dumpty what? Had a great fall. Please hear me, beloved. No believer... No child of God can play fast and loose and not expect to get burned. I have those mother-son mother talks and at times with my own mother, who's now 86 years old. One of the discussions we were having one day was uh, I was asking her, to what age must a pastor protect himself in relationships with the opposite sex? Great question to ask your 86-year-old mother. And she gave me only an answer she could give. She said, just remember, and please excuse her candor, 
because after all, she is pastor's mother. But she said, just remember, there are dirty old women, and don't ever forget that. That should go down in one of those books my mom does. <laughs> and really, we were having a conversation around these things this week, and, and I would say to, to David, to Pastor Craig, to the rest of us, no matter, you know, no matter how much you love your wife, stand guard. Never let your pastoral study turn into a den of adulterous iniquity. And I say that because the devil... 1 Peter 5.8 is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And of course, I pray that's not you, but I also observe something else, that when we set ourselves up for failure, we do that, and what creeps in? Pride. Pride. You know, it's when we develop a holier-than-thou complex. And we see examples of this, don't we? A lot of us enjoyed watching that television show about that ever-expanding family that had many, many children and how many washing machines, four or five or whatever. You know the family I'm talking about. I'm not going to name them by name, but I think you would probably know. But you look at them and you think to yourself, my family doesn't look like that. <laughs> but they did. You know, clean clothes every day. They were all matching and neatly pressed, the boys all had these short masculine haircuts, and it was all about learning good lessons from their parents, and we all thought to ourselves, how, how wonderful, and look at this, these parents are on a roll, man, they got all these kids, and they got, they are all crank, they're cranking these kids out so perfectly, until we all know what happened when the oldest son fell into repeated acts of, of sin, and the show disappeared off the air. And I say that not to disparage that young man's struggle. I feel sad about that. But to say, you know, we can look squeaky clean on the outside, but it never guarantees what's going on on the inside. And a holier-than-thou attitude is a rather dangerous perch. In fact, I believe that, that Satan, he works in such crafty ways. You know, I imagine that when King David built his palace, like we have builders in the church, and you may have a home like this, that when he went out on his palace, veranda, the porch, the patio, or whatever, way up in the air, he must have been out there many, many, many times, maybe reading books, maybe writing psalms, looking across Jerusalem, so beautiful, the view he had. He could see the Mount of Olives, the Kidron Valley, the magnificent landscape. And then there she was. You know her name, Bathsheba. I hope that we're being careful. Another observation I make drawing from this passage is it's also, whether you realize it or not, overflowing with great hope and promise. Do you know why I say that? Because the Lord, he predicts they're all going to fall away, and they did, but it never stopped Jesus from still being their friend or from ministering into their lives, or caring for their needs. Why? Because this passage is actually setting us up to tell us something about Jesus, that his grace, his love, and his mercy was far more infinite than their personal failures. Yes, even their sin. You know how powerfully that speaks to me? It reaffirms that we do have a God of second chances. We have a God whose love for us is not like the world's. God's love for us is unconditional and everlasting. Now, does that not speak to you to realize, here's Jesus. 
He could have thrown his hands up in the air. He could have said, fellas, I've been with you for three years. And you're going to do this to me? You're going to stab me in the back? But no, Jesus remained their friend. And we all know what happens. I don't have to tell you with Peter how the Lord comes to him later and does what? He restores him. Please heed this advice. It's not original with me. In life, we're all going to experience varying degrees of failure. That's a part of living in this world. But we must all learn from our mistakes, our failures, and our brokenness. That stated, I sure hope you haven't let the devil paralyze you from growing further into what God has created you to be. Just remember what 1 John 1, 9 says. If we confess our sins, I could insert in there, he's still our friend because he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How about that? That means God is right there. And if we're paralyzed by our failures, our sins, we have the opportunity to confess it and to walk into what he has created, which is newness of life. And what does that imply? Not only seeking God's forgiveness, but here's a big hurdle for a lot of people and how they become paralyzed. They've yet to forgive themselves. I see that. I see that with people, as an example, who are paralyzed by addiction. They, they carry like a banner of shame. But there's no shame if you're in Jesus Christ. There's no shame if you've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And what God would have for us is that we would forgive ourselves, not live in bondage to our past. Because if I don't forgive myself, that's actually what I'm doing to myself. I'm still bringing my past into my present. But the reality is, the past is in the past. And whereas, for as an Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. We are not corpses living in our past, but we are forgiven children with an eternal future. We, we have hope. And why I just pause on these verses today about Peter is, is to say Peter had issues. And so did all the disciples have issues. And so do all of us have issues too. And there is no perfect parent. And no, it doesn't matter. However they turn out, it's not your fault. <laughs> really isn't. And I'll tell you, I want to tell you why. The Lord gave me a word the other, the other day. It was at, at the breakfast while David, I think you were speaking right recently. He didn't even have us looking at the verse, so I was being bad. I was looking at something else. Maybe you'd like to see it. It's Proverbs 1. This isn't even in my notes, but I feel led to share this. Proverbs 1, verse 8. Solomon, who's speaking to his child, hear, my son, your father's instruction, and don't forsake your mother's teaching. Now, that's the parenting part, right? And that's what we've all attempted to do, haven't we? Right? And he says to... He says to his son, indeed, your father's instruction, your mother's teaching, they're, they're a graceful wreath to your head. And they are ornaments about your neck. It is to say is what your parents have done for you, how they have raised you, how they have sought to instill in you God's truth. It's, a, it's like saying, it's a beautiful thing. This is good. But Solomon says one more thing, though, in verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, and that's where I want to stop. If sinners entice you, what's he saying? You're still going to have a choice. And it's going to be not your mom and dad's choice, but you're going to have to make the choice. Where are you going to go with this? 
Of course, Solomon told him, don't consent. But as we all know, many do. But it's not our fault. And you have to let go of that one and realize that all of us individually really do stand individually before God and will give account of ourselves. And it is to say, yes, Peter had issues. We all have issues. And while his intentions were good, his faults were written all over his sleeves. But even more encouraging in this passage is not the prediction of his failure, but the fact that Jesus still stood with him as his best friend. And even though Jesus is perfect and righteous and holy, he never wavered. Jesus never wavered from being that powerful, life-giving presence in Peter's life. Sometimes we're tempted, aren't we, to give up on ourselves. God doesn't give up on us. Heavenly Father, we're reminded today that failures are certain to come. And most certainly in this fallen world where sin abounds, yet you give us such hope because where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And for those of us who perhaps today have had a hard time forgiving ourselves, may we release ourselves from that bondage and live in God's grace. Father, thank you for being that faithful and good friend. We praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen.